Even though this is a, uh, an introductory course, we're going to be covering a lot of territory. Today you'll be listening to me talk quite a bit, but also be giving you an opportunity to uh, uh, communicate with some of your peers here uh, this morning. And so I'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, kind of to talk about the overview of the workshop, we're first going to start with an overview of the protocols for Native American archive materials, which I'll be referring to in short uh, throughout the course as the protocols. Uh, how many of you, just as a quick show of hands, are familiar with the protocols? And how many are not? Okay, great. So we've got a mixed bunch. Um, from there, we are going to actually look into a case study uh, uh, that was conducted by Brian Carpenter at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. He wrote a very um, a profound case study on how the APS applied the protocols to their institution. Uh, to, uh, and so we'll get into some of that. And then from there, we'll have a, a short uh, kind of exercise that we'll look at another um, uh, case study that was done by uh, Jonathan Pringle at uh, Northern Arizona University's Klein Library. Uh, from there, we will kind of break out into uh, another discussion in which we kind of ask the questions of what do the protocols mean to you now after you've had a chance to kind of learn a little bit about them and uh, how does your institution uh, implement them, if, if at all. I see we're coming through a little bit clearer now. Everyone can hear me okay? All right, great. If at any point uh, you can't hear me or, or whatnot, please let me know. For the second half of the workshop, that's where we're going to kind of, after, after you kind of get a little bit of a sense of what the protocols are and, and how they've been uh, handled at some institutions, then we're going to kind of give you uh, some tools uh, for effectively preparing your institution. Uh, we'll start with a, an introduction to a range of interactions. Um, this is really going to kind of focus on uh, the institution that I work at. Uh, which is the Sam Noble Museum. Again, we're a non-tribal institution and um, uh, that has a history that goes back to the late 1800s, but um, we're currently in a, a newer facility that was established in the year 2000, and we'll be kind of looking at uh, the spectrum of collaborative initiatives that our museum have undertaken with uh, collaborating with tribal communities, not only in Oklahoma, but throughout uh, the North American continent. And then we'll kind of get into uh, some, uh, we'll be going over a, um, uh, an auditing spreadsheet uh, that you should have all received um, uh, via email. Uh, this is kind of a, a spreadsheet that the NAS team, the Native American Archives section, and I uh, helped uh, put together that can be used for um, effectively uh, helping you manage uh, the metadata that you collect at your institution. And, um, and, be, uh, and will work as an effective tool when you're collaborating with tribal communities. Then uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, how at the museum that I work at, um, uh, some of the, uh, the auditing that we have taken um, to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're, a, we're, we're a collection that is exclusively comprised of Native American materials, so our, our auditing wasn't necessarily about identifying uh, Native American materials in our institution, but rather how we worked with tribal communities to uh, better improve our metadata standards and schema. And then we'll have a, a guest from uh, University of Arizona Special Collections, um, uh, Veronica Reyes Escudero. She'll be talking a little bit about uh, her uh, uh, department's um, auditing that they conducted there at uh, the U of A. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, digital repatriation. And just a quick show of hands, how many of you are unfamiliar with that term? OK, a couple. So this is a, a we'll be talking throughout the, uh, throughout the course of the sort of range of interactions and, uh, between uh, uh, archivists, librarians, museum, and other uh, collection professionals and tribal communities, and that digital repatriation may be a part of these uh, collaborative initiatives. So part one, how to identify the protocols. We're going to start with just a little bit of an overview of the protocols. Uh, 
And this reads that for more than a decade, a common goal uh, amongst tribal leaders, archivists, and librarians across North America has been to strengthen the connection uh, that exists and to develop new relationships with tribal, uh, uh, with non-tribal institutions that have collection materials that originated uh, from or are concerned to Native American communities. Uh, this is wide, has been widely supported by a range of professional organizations, uh, including SSA. And so in April of 2006, there was a gathering of 19 Native and non-Native archivists, librarians, and other uh, professionals representing more than 15 uh, Native American communities, and they gathered in Arizona to uh, address how non-tribal institutions uh, who possess or that possess Native American collection materials can be culturally responsive to, uh, these mater to these materials and provide culturally appropriate services to affiliated communities. And throughout these discussions, there were these reoccurring themes that uh, kept coming to the surface. Um, a number of these themes pertaining to human rights uh, continuously emerged issues ranging from understanding Native American values and perspectives to applying accurate context to Native American uh, archival materials. This is in conjunction with a number of related policy and legal uh, issues, including uh, the importance of consultation with and concurrence of tribal communities to uh, in decisions and policy making, uh, the need to recognize and provide special treatments for uh, culturally sensitive materials, rethinking public accessibility and use of some materials, the role of intellectual and cultural property rights, the need to consider copying, sharing, and or the repatriation of certain materials, uh, reciprocal education and training, and raising awareness of these issues within the archival profession. In addition to the issues uh, raised in the meeting, the protocols build upon numerous professional ethical codes, uh, international declarations acknowledging indigenous rights, including several uh, now that have been uh, issued by the United Nations. And what they produced was this document that uh, we come to know as the Protocols for Native American Materials, or the Protocols. And uh, so the protocols essentially refer to, uh, um, uh, refers to a living document. So by that I mean something that can be modified over time uh, as new issues uh, arise. And, um, and uh, ultimately have a set of recommendations included in them for best practices for culturally responsive care. So I want to kind of break, uh, get into uh, how the protocols are organized, talk about their anatomy. Um, uh, the uh, protocols are broken into 10 chapters with these overarching themes that again came up in these discussions. Uh, the first, as you can see, is the, uh, the recognition that um, tribal communities are uh, sovereign governments. They have associated rights. Issues in the collection, ownership, preservation, uh, handling, access, and use of American Indian archival resources, the importance of building relationships that are sustainable and long-lasting and meaningful, and the need to expand the nature of uh, information uh, professions to include Native American perspectives and knowledge. So when we look at the first theme, uh, the, I won't get into a history lesson, but we know that Native people have lived in the Americas for thousands of years. Uh, pr prior to um, uh, European conquest of the Americas in the 1400s, uh, tribes had their own traditional governments that maintained their own lands, laws, legal restrictions surrounding cultural issues. And there are over 570 federally recognized tribes here in the U.S., more than 5 million people. Uh, and um, uh, 22, for example, that are here in Arizona, 39 uh, in my home state of uh, Oklahoma. And so with this uh, nationhood status, uh, tribal nations are distinct separate political entities from the federal and state government who adopt and enforce their own laws. These uh, tribal laws can effectuate uh, 
the curation of cultural materials and content, and it is important to be cogniz uh, cognizant of this. Uh, tribal communities can elect to enter into memorandums of understanding of various sorts or any other level of formalized agreements and contracts with uh, local townships, state and federal uh, governments, or simply choose to opt out of them altogether. <laughs> uh, this is important to note, uh, especially if you work in um, town uh, historic commissions or state repositories or federal agencies of that sort. The second theme, uh, issues in the collection, ownership, preservation, handling, access, and use of American Indian archival resources. Uh, here we're talking about how historically information regarding uh, tribal cultural practices, uh, traditional environmental knowledge were captured um, or collected mostly by anthropologists who sometimes uh, or more often than not uh, sort of misrepresented the communities that they were, uh, that they were working with. Um, and, that, uh, and so information can often appear quite crude or simply inaccurate. And so here we have a picture of uh, Francis Densmore playing back a recording to a uh, chief of the Blackfoot Nation. And uh, so again, information was captured from a certain point of view and imbued into the interpretation of this information. Um, uh, for example, early first-hand account of explorers about Native American groups were written from a colonial lens and often written in order to justify the colonization of land, people, and resources. An example can be seen in this image here of a lithograph courtesy of the Indiana Historical Society that uh, is dated from 1860. And here, um, the scene ultimately represents a meeting between the Shawnee uh, warrior chief Tecumseh uh, uh, I'm sorry, between the Shawnee warrior and Chief Tecumseh and General William Henry Harrison at uh, Vincennes in August of 1810. And Tecumseh is portrayed as this large, uh, muscular, threatening uh, Indian um, who reacted to Harrison with violence without provocation. And uh, this image of Tecumseh helped to justify the violence against the removal of native people uh, from the Ohio Valley. In 1974, uh, modern IRB methods were introduced. Um, and um, so here we're, uh, and then later on we have the passage of the Native American Graves and uh, Protection and Repatriation Act uh, that took place, which essentially took legal steps to correct these types of historical wrongdoings. And, uh, and hopefully and potentially reshape um, uh, 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 these sorts of uh, problems that we have. This is information. Uh, transmission varies from tribe to tribe. Uh, some traditional information, such as uh, cultural practices and customs, is hierarchically disseminated. Uh, this means that this traditional knowledge may be intended for certain groups, subgroups within the traditional uh, system uh, of information. And so provisions for special restrictions uh, can, um, uh, again, can vary. And so it's important to consider these treatments on a case-by-case -case basis. This leads into the third theme, which, uh, again, is the importance of building uh, meaningful relationships and so the successful implementation of the protocols is dependent on uh, this relationship building. This is sort of the, the key and overarching theme of what this uh, workshop is essentially about and what the protocols are about. This here says that developing relationships and regular interactions can lead to true collaboration and consulting, uh, cons consultation met methods, which will optimize the descriptions and captions of archival resources. Uh, typical ways in which this materialize are in uh, crowdsourcing metadata to correct inaccuracies, and we'll get into some of that uh, later on. Uh, accommodating the needs expressed to you by tribal entities and archival settings can transcend the cultural concerns highlighted in the protocols. And these concerns can relate to other typical access or restriction protocols relevant to privacy and maintaining the integrity of the individual. 
and essentially uh, good customer service skills are essential. The, the last theme is the need to expand the nature of information uh, professions to include the perspectives and knowledge of native communities. So here there may be uh, technical concerns that might not allow for optimum use of American Indian archival materials such as subject headings which are typically exonyms of uh, tribal communities so this essentially requires a cataloging remedy. You can see um, here some examples for example Dene Bizad, uh, uh, which more commonly referred to in English Navajo versus uh, uh, Comanche uh, the differentiation between uh, Tucson and how that actually translates in the Pima Papago language. So as I mentioned, the protocols are built into or are formed into 10 chapters, and we're going to kind of uh, break those down here in just a minute to better understand how these are all uh, organized. Um, each of the chapters includes a foundational si uh, statement that essentially conceptualizes the general concept of the chapter and um, then is followed by bulleted guidelines for action to assist archives and libraries with their questions regarding Native American archival materials. And uh, in some cases, and, I'll, and you'll see this in more detail, there are also, um, uh, for some chapters, recommendations for how Native American communities can um, facilitate action as well on their part. So the first chapter is building relationships of mutual respect. It says collecting institutions and native communities are encouraged to engage in meaningful consultation to build relationships that ensure the respectful care and use of archival material and identify mutually beneficial solutions to common problems. And so here, this chapter includes both guidelines for archives and libraries as well as uh, Native American communities. Here it says that uh, for the archives and libraries guidelines, we're talking about proper entities to contact to facilitate consultation. So uh, in other words, if you um, are, uh, are confronted with native materials in your collections and you ask that general question of what do I do, who do I call, uh, et cetera, this is a very common um, uh, question uh, that uh, occurs, especially for those of you in non-tribal organizations. And so as you're using the protocols to um, help guide you in, uh, in, these, in developing these, um, these relationships, this essentially is um, what we're talking about here is this is where you would go in the protocols to, to get those answers that you may, uh, to the questions that you may have. Uh, also in this section, we're talking about what to do if Native American materials are out of scope of your institutional holdings, how to properly uh, remove them or handle them. Uh, in accordance with uh, various tribal laws. This can sometimes get tricky, and so this uh, follows in line with the first bullet point. Documenting agreements with communities uh, through various memorandums of agreement or other forms of um, uh, 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 legal or, or informal uh, notations and, and honoring those commitments. Uh, guidelines for access, use, acquisition, and disposition, including those with strong cultural affiliation or sensitive content and time uh, as a factor for building trusting meaningful relationships. And so this last bullet point really states that uh, beating, me, building meaningful relationships are not going to happen overnight, that these are things that will take time and um, uh, really kind of hones in on the notion of building uh, trust. Um, there are also guidelines for Native American communities. Uh, we're talking about publicizing who will act as community represent, uh, representatives and speak on behalf of them, methods for identifying collecting institutions that hold relevant materials, guidelines for how archives and libraries may provide access and use, uh, documenting agreements with communities, recognizing partnerships publicly uh, through various outlets, uh, whether it be through uh, um, Oh, uh, tribal newspapers or, or, other, uh, or other forms of uh, um, publication and methods for offering expertise to institutions. And as we're going through these, uh, the anatomy, you'll, you'll really see the kind of interrelatedness that exists between these chapters, that, um, uh, that, that they're very interconnected. The second chapter is uh, striving for balance in content and perspectives. 
This essentially uh, talks about uh, states that Native American communities and collecting institutions share a desire to preserve cultural heritage and to serve as a bridge between the past, present, and future. However, differences exist in values, culture, knowledge systems, appropriate, and approaches to learning. And archivists and librarians taught to champion intellectual freedom and unfettered open access to resources may uh, be troubled by the notion that in Native uh, American and other indigenous communities, knowledge can be collectively owned and that access to some knowledge may be restricted as a privilege rather than a right. And so the question becomes, how should the needs of uh, North American Indian tribes uh, be balanced with a democratic society as a whole. Uh, as we've learned in library school and whatnot, it's all been about open access and providing information, uh, sort of just, uh, you know, there and, and such. And so this is essentially uh, providing a sort of yield sign, if you will. Um, and so the uh, bullets for archives and libraries guidelines for actions states that uh, or this basically, in this section, uh, provides guidelines for collection development and care that speaks to the notion of inclusivity and respect that balances both Native American and Western approaches. And on the other hand, uh, guidelines for Native American communities is essentially questioning and understanding ways in which archives and libraries manage and preserve collections, promote revitalization, and support Native community goals. The third chapter, is on accessibility and use. And um, uh, this states that as recognized by SSA, the American Library Association, other professional bodies, Native American requests for increased access to and sometimes control over information resources found in non-tribal organizations um, is in keeping with current professional codes of ethics as recognized by these organizations. And so questions of access, ownership, and control of archival materials um, pertaining to indigenous tribes can prompt a range of philosophical and practical uh, concerns, especially considering how each sovereign nation um, off, uh, operates independently from one another, that they all have their own um, individual protocols and mandates. And, um, and so our guidelines for archives and libraries within this section, as you'll find, are uh, ethical and legal conditions for acquiring, preserving, accessing, and uh, public, uh, um, publicizing materials, guidelines for what to or what not to require from researchers, depositors, and uh, both uh, Native and non-Native patrons, understanding the information-seeking behaviors of uh, Native communities and how involving communities can create welcoming and comfortable spaces for Native American visitors, and the impact of worldwide digital access to resources once only available on site, which is especially important now that we're well into this digital age that we're into. This section uh, does not offer guidelines for Native American uh, communities, but again, uh, even though that is absent, there is still this interrelatedness between the different chapters that uh, there is guidance um, there in other sections. The fourth chapter, really talks about, again, how uh, the Western perspective on libraries, um, archives, and museum collections has largely been based on open access. However, um, cultural heritage materials challenge these ideas, specifically uh, when it comes to resources containing information deemed sacred or sensitive. Uh, in many cases, collection staff have only worked under the principles of open access and are therefore unaware of how to handle sacred or culturally sensitive materials when those materials are discovered in their collections or, uh, or requested by the public for that matter. And so as a result, uh, these materials may wrongly undergo the same processing treatment as those with no access restrictions whatsoever, leading uh, community members to confront the institution in an effort to uh, cease public access. So here in this section, we have guidelines for archives and libraries. Uh, the guidelines here are for consulting with culturally affiliated community representatives to identify culturally sensitive materials, developing procedures and reviewing policies regarding access and use. And there are also examples of the kinds of archival materials, uh, both digital and uh, analog, which may be culturally sensitive from a Native American perspective. And I see I left out a space there, apologies. 
And so I wanted to bring this up, and this will be included in the handouts that you should be uh, um, uh, that you should have received. But I just want to point out because again, this is this reoccurring thing that occurs with um, folks who may not know um, what to do when they're confronted with indigenous materials, and um, these are the the sorts of materials that are um, uh, which may be culturally sensitive from a Native American perspective, and so these are the sort of things to watch out for. Uh, everything from recordings and transcripts, cartographic materials, still and moving images such as photographs and films, as well as graphic art, uh, records, documents, ephemera, literature, thesis, dissertation, public text, so a whole range of materials that are very common, uh, commonly found in archives. And this is a good time to, proto uh, um, to go over what the protocols cover. You can see on the left-hand side, these are the sort of uh, analog and uh, digital materials that are explicitly covered in the protocols. And uh, I won't read them out, but you can see what they are. And versus those that are not covered. Um, and the, the thing about this is that what's not covered is usually under the purview or under the protection of, uh, of uh, guidelines such as NAGPRA and such. So when you think about human remains, sacred cultural and patrimonial objects, uh, things that are found in the ground, uh, clothing or regalia, yeah, there's even some question over contemporary artwork. But you can see uh, it's highlighted next to what's not covered, consider associated archival materials. So even if something is not explicitly covered in the protocols, there may be associated documents that, um, that are covered in the protocols. and so. Really, the, the, le the, the emphasis here is, is placed on the idea of questioning everything. And this really um, uh, provides a window for uh, collaboration between you and Native communities to, uh, to be able to engage in these talks to determine what, um, uh, what, what and how, uh, or how these things should be handled. <clears throat> Chapter five is about providing context. Uh, this basically uh, goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about how outdated, inaccurate, derogatory, or Eurocentric language may appear in some materials or in the associated metadata. And so descriptive information can be approved with the addition of culturally appropriate and accurate language. And this can uh, range from original titles all the way down to finding aids. And so in this section, you'll have guidelines for archives and libraries. This includes methods for communicating with native communities, as well as non, uh, uh, both native and non-native patrons regarding the context of collections, establishing workflows to resolve issues of inaccuracy and offensiveness. And then on the other side, uh, guidelines for native communities. There is assistance that's provided in this section in the identification of people, places, events, and language within materials. And, uh, and really sort of uh, promotes the notion of providing assistance in modifying contextual metadata and, and supporting uh, archives and libraries accordingly. Chapter six, uh, here we are saying that cultural heritage and traditional knowledge is a right of indigenous people as recognized by numerous international declarations, many of which have been adopted by the, uh, the UN and that Western copyright laws are based on principles which conflict with uh, indigenous uh, legal approaches to knowledge. And in some cases, um, uh, Native American knowledge has been copyrighted by outsiders without proper permissions or approval. And so here, the uh, guidelines for archives and libraries are, uh, uh, in this section, this section really addresses issues regarding the uh, misappropriation of titles, copyright, authorship, and as, as it applies to these materials. Uh, considering how consultations with culturally affiliated communities are adequate for determining the legality and ethical nature in which materials and archives exist. And this section also really addresses the notion of expanding the idea of moral rights to protect Native American cultural and intellectual property. Chapter seven considers uh, the protection and safe return of cultural property to the communities in which they originated as recognized by a whole network of both national and international uh, bylaws, including but certainly not limited to uh, NAGPRA. Um, and uh, this includes objects of cultural patrimony, which is defined within NAGPRA as any property 
both tangible or intangible, that is owned by a community is inalienable except by community consent and which may be fundamental elements of a community's cultural identity and heritage. And so within this chapter, the question is raised as to whether cultural patrimony extends to include culturally sensitive archival materials. And so here we have guidelines uh, for archives and libraries for responding to requests for copies of archival resources as well as the return or repatriation as well as retention and overall control of materials and knowledge with consideration for who the information within materials is uh, intended for. And guidelines uh, for Native American communities are provided uh, for researching, requesting, and reviewing archival collections and associated legal agreements to ensure their uh, safety in the areas of both repatriation and acquisition. Uh, getting close to the end, chapter eight, this is a states that collecting institutions are dedicated to public education, research, and, so and service, often with oversight from a formal review board for the protection of human subjects. And similarly, an increasing number of Native American tribes have developed formal research policies and procedures to defend against misappropriation and abuse of traditional knowledge. And so the emphasis here is that institutions and communities mutually benefit when research is conducted in accordance with the highest possible ethical and legal standards. Uh, the, the bullets for guidelines for archives and libraries uh, states that, um, or really talks about how archives and libraries can communicate transparently uh, with uh, Native communities, um, patrons conducting research on Native American communities, and potential donors to ensure community research and cultural property protocols are upheld. And then uh, guidance for Native communities is provided for how Native communities can communicate transparently with archive and library staff in the development and understanding of research protocols. For Chapter 9, uh, Reciprocal Education and Training, uh, this states that within our dynamic society and information professions, archivists and librarians can reconsider different methods for delivering uh, information and constructing um, uh, information um, uh, methods and paradigms. This can be done by welcoming and allowing Native American practitioners to serve as equal partners in the care of cultural heritage and through cross-cultural uh, training and uh, educational exchange, collecting institutions, communities, and the realm of academia will collectively strengthen and grow. Uh, our, our guidelines here for archives are uh, in this section it outlines how archivists and librarians can learn from tribal archivists, historians, storytellers, teachers, orators, elders, and other professionals uh, within the communities who possess a unique sense of knowledge and understanding of their respective communities. Uh, this section also addresses the importance of supporting Native American students in, educating, uh, in education and training programs, employing American Indian staff in visible positions, and forming advisory bodies or boards with diverse uh, uh, community represent, uh, repre representation. And the guidelines for Native American communities are, uh, this section considers ways in which Native American communities can effectively become active in the archives profession and foster lifelong learning. And then lastly, the, uh, the last ch uh, chapter of the protocols is awareness of Native American uh, communities and issues. And so, here this states that the protocols are intended to alleviate any uncertainty amongst archivists and librarians in regards to culturally respect respectful care and use of Native American archival materials. And so this chapter sort of functions as a, as a conclusion to, uh, to the document, um, sort of uh, you know, taking everything in full circle. And uh, here we have uh, guidelines for action um, for proactively raising awareness of issues surrounding Native American communities. And then you'll see within the document that this is followed by uh, a, gloss a glossary of common terms that appear throughout the document, and then um, a bibliography for assisting you in further reading and resources. And as I mentioned before, this is a, a living document, and so there, um, uh, it's, it's open to change, and there are plenty of resources out there to assist you. Yeah, we seem to be good on time. Everyone doing okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to get 
into an overview of uh, the case study that I mentioned that was conducted by Brian Carpenter at the American Philosophical Society in uh, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to kind of uh, give, a, give an overview of that study and uh, thank Brian Carpenter at the APS for providing uh, information regarding this as well as uh, including some of the images that you see here. <laughs> So in 1743, the American Philosophical Society was founded to, quote, promote useful knowledge, uh, which is a, a very broad term. <laughs> uh, the APS is um, the oldest repository in North America uh, regarding um, archival materials on the languages, cultures, uh, histories, and continuing presence of indigenous peoples of the Americas. And it's important to note that they are a non-tribal organization. <clears throat> The uh, tradition of the APS library of collecting materials really goes back to um, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was president of the Society of APS uh, from 1797 to 1815, in addition to his role as president of, of the US. Um, certainly a controversial figure. Who, um, I won't get into that lesson here. But, um, uh, but really what uh, Jefferson was doing in his time at the APS was creating, compiling, and disseminating lists of uh, vocabulary terms to investigate and compare the similarities of native languages. And then there is Peter Stephen Duponceau, uh, who was the main, success, uh, main, success for, main successor to Thomas Jefferson. He was uh, the first archivist of indigenous languages in the United States. And uh, he sort of turns the APS into this uh, premier research center in North America. <clears throat> so native communities have been using archival materials at the APS uh, library and other non-tribal institutions for years, despite common access barriers that have led to the exclusion of native community-based researchers. And uh, these exclusions can uh, uh, include uh, the remoteness of repositories in relation to where that knowledge originally created, uh, uh, originated, uh, prohibitive duplication costs, and the lack of relevant information in the catalog records that contribute to the discoverability of materials. And so archivists are coming to recognize that native community members are on an authoritative source, arguably more so than outside scholars regarding indigenous materials. And so therefore, as stated in uh, Brian Carpenter's case study, uh, equitable and respectful inclusion of this expertise in the improvement of archival description is not just a matter of respect, but also a pract of practical benefit to archival institutions seeking to represent their collections more accurately, appropriately, and meaningfully. So um, uh, the APS, starting in 2007, began a series of um, uh, um, interrelated grant projects following the creation of the protocols uh, that we've been discussing throughout uh, this morning. And this, uh, uh, this interrelated grant, uh, series of grant projects were really aimed at digital preservation and enhanced access of its indigenous collections, followed by larger commitments and culturally responsive policies. And you should have a handout that, uh, that you can look at, but we'll get into some of the, the details here. And so there were essentially five um, uh, projects that took place, the first being the Getty Image Project, uh, which was a three-year project followed by uh, two projects that were uh, uh, grant-funded projects by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. That led into a, a concurring um, uh, uh, project of, in which the APS developed their own protocols. Um, uh, and then this led to the founding of CNAIR and the digital knowledge and digital knowledge sharing, which I'll get into in just a moment. And again, I should note that uh, the APS did not carry out these initiatives strictly as a way of implementing the protocols, nor has it to this day implemented all aspects of it, but rather over the course of several years completed the projects that meet 
um, and both address the needs for proper care and management of its collections and meet the needs of the institutions. Um, the projects most closely relate to chapters one, three, four, and five of the protocols, but over time, uh, the development of these projects ultimately led to the growth of the APS as an institution on a much broader scale, more closely in line with uh, some of the other chapters that are um, uh, outlined in the protocols. Again, sort of showing the, the interrelatedness of the protocols and how, uh, um, as you're working through these sorts of projects in your institutions, that you'll see that a, a variety of things are, are coming into play. So the first project was the Getty Image Project that started in 2007. This was a three-year project focusing on conducting a full survey of the American Philosophical Society Library's collections of photographs, drawings, and other visual images of Native American life and culture dating back to the 18th century. And what I've done throughout these slides is sort of annotate them in blue with um, the associated chapters within the protocol so you can kind of have a visual uh, um, uh, reference. Uh, the project archivist that was hired was, uh, identified more than 130,000 images in hundreds of collections at the APS and digitized, cataloged, uh, a little over 1,100 of them. This led to the potential for wider public access that led to the formation of a Native American advisory board comprised of Native and non-Native scholars, information professionals, and cultural uh, experts, as you can see, relates to Chapter 3 on access and use as well as Chapter 9 on Reciprocal Education and Training. The, uh, the board that was formed uh, reviewed the images that were digitized prior to them being made available online. And what they did is uh, uh, flagged individual items that were potentially culturally sensitive or otherwise inappropriate for general public access online, uh, identified broader subject matter, uh, matter categories, of potential cultural sensitivity that could aid archivists who may not have experience in this area in flagging items of concern. And, uh, and they also developed recommendations for procedures on how to locate, contact, and appropriately request guidance from authorities in indigenous communities from which the images of concern originated, which you can see is in line with uh, the chapters on access and use and culturally sensitive materials. Uh, these discussions form the basis of a long-standing commitment to developing policies for restricting reproductions and publications of culturally sensitive materials, which you can see is in line with uh, Chapter 4 of the Protocols. This was, uh, that project was followed by a three-year uh, grant project um, uh, that was funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the first of two projects. And so for this project, uh, Brian Carpenter was hired as the project archivist, and he conducted a full survey of audio collections based on available descriptions, identifying the audio that related to languages uh, with uh, less than 100 uh, fluent speakers, um, and digitized and cataloged in-scope recordings, which included locating related documents in the APS's manuscript collections to assist in the formation of qualitative metadata and line item records for every song, story, interview, elicitation session, etc., which you can see is in line with Chapter 5, which is really about providing context to the, uh, to, um, the, the materials and associated metadata. Um, up to this point, the lack of metadata um, that they had at the APS had uh, resulted in very low usage of the recordings, despite the fact that a number of the materials um, appeared in the APS's catalog and guides for more than half of a century. And so the objective here was to, was to fix that. <clears throat> this project also brought in a new project director who had experience in successfully collaborating with uh, uh, um, Native communities and in humanities projects. The incoming project director followed up with Native researchers who he had um, established meaningful relationships with over time, uh, using the APS collections to better understand their information-seeking behaviors and the overall broader context and success of their research within the APS's library, um, which again follows in line with that first chapter of the Protocols of Building Mutual uh, and respectful relationships. Uh, 
And this follow-up uh, with tribal communities informed communities that there was um, a friend there at the APS, that there was a point of contact um, who uh, communities could, could communicate with on issues ranging from research goals to policy changes um, uh, that, and other things that they had really desired from the APS. And this is in line with Chapter 3 on accessibility and use, as well as the chapter of the protocols dealing with reciprocal education and training. And then lastly, with this project, um, outreach efforts uh, paved the way for a conference at the APS in May 2010 entitled Building Bridges Between Archives and Indian Communities, which is in line with uh, reciprocal education and training and awareness of Native American communities and issues. And this was a very important um, uh, conference that, again, sort of publicly emphasized that there were these points of contacts and that, um, and sort of showed that the APS was trying to open their arms to Native communities and wanted to work with them <clears throat> to sort of reverse those barriers that had existed there previously. Uh, the first grant was followed up with a second Mellon Audio project from 2011 to 2014, and this grant focused on digitizing the rest of the uh, audio recordings in the, or the indigenous audio recordings in the APS's library in partnership with four Native American communities uh, that uh, wanted to work with APS. That includes the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, the Penobscot uh, Nation, the uh, Tuscarora Nation, as well as a group of um, uh, Anishinaabe communities in the U.S. and in Canada. Again, following in line with the first chapter on building relationships that are meaningful and respectful. And so the focus of this project was not only on um, preserving and providing access, uh, but more so centered on demonstrating how an archives can develop ongoing meaningful partnerships with Native communities in conjunction with providing discoverability and access to materials. What they found throughout this project was that there was, uh, uh, working with four different communities, was that there was uh, significant differences um, that existed, uh, not only in the size of the communities, uh, the infrastructure that existed within these communities um, in terms of you know, technical in infrastructure, funding, um, available and other available resources, uh, the kinds and quantities of materials uh, concerning their communities that were at the uh, APS library, including linguistic notebooks, English-only ethnographic manuscripts, historic photographs, medicinal information, sacred traditional knowledge, and audio recordings, and that their priorities uh, for a partnership with APS really differed. And, uh, and uh, the levels in which the community members worked with the library also varied. <clears throat> so the range of priorities amongst the groups included obtaining copies of all archival materials concerning the source community to foster local community access and outreach, uh, which is in line with chapter seven of the protocols on uh, copying and repatriation of records, uh, working to support language revitalization initiatives intellectual property concerns, uh, and identifying and protecting culturally sensitive materials through the signing of a formalized MOU. Uh, each of the four community partners contributed to the modification of catalog records to fix inaccuracies and or fill in missing information and explain the significance of materials in relation to contemporary indigenous contexts, an approach of knowledge exchange and relationship building that would form the basis of the APS library's reference and outreach activities that continue to this day. So in tandem with the second Mellon uh, grant project and following the earlier established uh, protocols that we've been discussing this morning, uh, the APS developed um, and eventually adopted their own set of protocols uh, for the treatment of indigenous materials. And the APS protocols is, again, this uh, public living document similar to uh, the protocols that we've been discussing, uh, despite its guidelines being directed at the APS library uh, uh, exclusively. Um, the protocols include general categories of content to flag, which is especially useful in cases where the APS does not have existing contacts 
with the communities in question, such as non-public ceremonies, uh, information on sacred sites, funerary practices, medicine, etc. Uh, the this includes procedures for flagging materials, such as identifying them as such in finding aids, labeling the physical folder uh, in the collections, and uh, so that researchers who view the materials in the reading room have an additional um, uh, form of information that notifies them that. Uh, materials within that folder may be restricted and are, um, or, uh, uh, from reproduction or copying, and that the uh, boxes that contain restricted folders are also labeled uh, to, uh, again, provide another, another bit of information for staff who go to retrieve those materials from the collections. In addition to development of the APS protocol, staff conducted a project to conduct a full survey of the collections aimed at identifying potentially sensitive materials. This is in line with uh, several of the chapters within the, uh, the protocols. And within this section, uh, they identified certain materials such as Cherokee formulae and images of, um, of masks pointing to similar materials in the personal papers of anthropologists known for heavily researching and publishing on private information such as religion and ceremonial knowledge. And, uh, and one thing that Brian points out in his case study is that new items of concern continue to emerge as a result of ongoing research and they apply these practices accordingly as these materials are discovered and, uh, and continuously follow this notion of questioning everything and, uh, and continuously uh, searching for materials that may need to be flagged and, and and improved accordingly. So after these uh, projects that I just mentioned that the APS uh, uh, had conducted, this led to the founding of CNER, which uh, stands for the Center for Native American Indigenous Research uh, at the APS library. So it says improved metadata from aforementioned audio digitization projects and outreach efforts led to massive increase in use of APS indigenous collections. And you can see from the data that Brian provided me on the right, they had kept track uh, through their statistics that show this uh, large increase of, uh, of requests for materials from both uh, indigenous community members as well as non-indigenous community members. And these statistics and the stories that were shared by the project director who had maintained these meaningful relationships that I mentioned uh, regarding the four pilot partnerships um, and, and through that, uh, the, um, uh, the, the workshop that I had mentioned that was, uh, that was um, uh, established really um, led to the, the, the creation of CNAIR in 2014 with an endowment to make it a permanent component of the APS library. And so this is again really sort of encapsulate or falls under the purview of building relationships of mutual respect and being aware of issues um, uh, uh, relating to Native American communities. So in 2014, um, Brian notes that APS worked with four partner communities and that by 2018, APS, through this organization that is now a, a body within the APS library, uh, that the APS has uh, ongoing collaborative projects with over 30 indigenous communities. They have ongoing community level contacts with nearly 70 communities from the North American Arctic to Central America and has repatriated materials in some form to more than 200 communities. And so really, this is pretty interesting. Um, this image here shows Brian in the middle, uh, along with uh, two of the community members that they worked with, and they're holding a belt, which when you think about a belt, it's something that you wrap around uh, your body. And so what this is, um, you have, uh, you know, an, um, it has the ability of coming full circle with itself. And so what this, in, uh, this belt represents is really how uh, uh, there's this interconnectedness between the, uh, the APS and the groups that they partnered with, and, and I think is a really nice demonstration of how the protocols sort of um, work together uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a unit. So now uh, what we're going to do is break out into a little bit of a, um, sort of like your own activity of sorts um, in which uh, you should have been handled or handed a, uh, 
um, uh, handout that is a marked up version of the uh, Northern Arizona University's Klein Library and Protocols. And this gives you an opportunity, have they been handed out yet? Okay. And this gives you an opportunity to kind of just uh, look through on your own to see how the, uh, the, um, uh, the protocols have been implemented at the Klein Library. And you'll notice that the, uh, the document has been uh, annotated by the members of SAA's uh, Native American Archives section um, that because the way that this case study is formulated is a little bit different from Brian Carpenter's case study in that what it does is um, the Klein Library's case study essentially breaks it down uh, looking at chapter one of the protocols and how they've implemented them at the Klein Library, chapter two, et cetera, rather than you know, mixing them up. And so the annotations that you'll see in that document um, really sort of point to some of the bulleted points within those chapters, um, if, if that makes sense. And so uh, at this time, take a, take a moment to kind of look through those and see how uh, those those work and and compare them with the the document on uh, or on the uh, the protocols document. <clears throat> 